All right, so it is 6.01. I'm gonna go ahead and get started with our housekeeping stuff. We're super excited to have Charles Kayser here tonight. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is Allie Ryan. Um, I'm a tech employer specialist for the Louisville area. Um, you may also know um, my supervisor, Shannon, or you know my counterpart, David, in Lexington. Um, but after you get through your career readiness portion of the program, you may be sent along to me. Um, I work on the employer side of things mostly. Um, so yeah, we're super excited to have Charles here tonight. Just quickly, we do have a few other uh, guest speakers coming up. So on the 14th, we have Karen Russo, who's gonna be doing coding with emergency techno emerging, emerging technologies in finance, which is exciting, um, talking about FinTech and then, um, the 21st and the 28th, we have Gyan Gupta, who's going to be talking about a few different things. So intro to Scrum, roles, responsibilities, and ceremonies, and then um, Kanban and Scrum artifacts are the next one that, that they do. So um, for modular folks, if you're attending as part of your career readiness requirement, please remember to fill out the form in your uh, Google Classroom for um, to get credit for attending. Uh, if you are an alumni of the program or uh, towards the end of the program, I just wanted to say we posted a lot of great jobs with some employer partners today. So if you are on the market and you are done or almost done with the program, please take a look at the jobs channels. We have some good opportunities that are posted there. Um, Please keep yourself muted throughout the presentation. Um, definitely use the chat for questions and comments. Um, it's up to Charles whether um, we want to look at those at the end or if we want to kind of look at them as we go along. We'll have plenty of time at the end for question and answer though. Um, so without further ado, tonight uh, we are joined by Charles Kaiser. Am I saying that correctly, Kaiser? Yeah, that's uh, Kaiser. Kaiser, okay. Um, and he's a mentor for the software dev track uh, of our program, currently working as a security engineer for Cisco um, in the context of the cloud, so AWS. And he's going to be actually helping develop a cybersecurity course and an AWS course for the program eventually that will hopefully be available um, next year. So keep an eye out for announcements around that. He's helping our director, Brian, do that, which is fun. Um, so he does lots of things related to certificate and secret management, vulnerability management, automating threat intelligence, things like that, and works pretty often with Python, Ruby, Rust, and C Sharp. Um, and yeah, as you all may know, we're going to have a couple courses coming up um, next year that we got some grant money to develop. So just super thankful to Charles for helping us kind of get those off the ground, hopefully. So um, that's all I've got to say, and we'll hand it over to you, Charles. All right, cool. So you guys might have seen uh, in the announcements, you know, this is supposed to be a live demo. Trick, there's actually about 10 minutes of slides, uh, just to make sure that we are all on the same page before we actually get into hacking stuff. So, um, you know, as Ali said, um, I've, hacking was kind of like the way that I got into tech. That's like, that was my introduction to uh, everything that we are all doing, right? Um, I actually had some stuff related to intro uh, set up, but uh, yeah, Ali did a great job. So um, 
Yeah, I've been actually a performer for like most of my life. And uh, when talking about like hacking, software development, those sorts of things, um, it feels pretty similar mentally to the way that you write songs, right? It's pretty intuitive. It's there are rules around it, but there's not a strict like this is the only possible way that you do it, right? So, um, and most importantly, I do like long walks on the beach and I have four cats. And I live in West Virginia. So I'm going to skip and hop from you folks. So tonight is all about hackers, right? Um, hackers are actually descended from this uh, kind of grouping of people that were called freakers with a PHR on the front of that. Freakers actually hacked stuff with like telephones and that sort of stuff. Uh, hackers kind of came after that, right? Um, so hackers have existed like since computers were created, right? Like some of the first hacks that uh, we've identified were conducted back in like, I think the first major one was like mid 50s, late 50s, maybe around 1960. Um, at that time, everything was around like cyber warfare. That's actually the first time that you start seeing what becomes later known as cyber warfare, right? Um, and that sort of stuff gets pretty interesting. They don't all look like, you know, um, people trying to tap into the matrix with a cyber deck, right? And the only reason that hackers wear hoodies is because they have really cold air conditioning in their rooms and they never leave. So traditionally the word hacker is, was meant for like um, tech enthusiasts, right? That was kind of the thing. And there's confusion oftentimes because that is still a thing, right? So like when you hear about like hackathons, um, me, for example, was very confused when I first heard that phrase because I thought, well, where's the hacking where's why am i learning about like arduinos and these crazy robots that people make or like these apps that may not make sense but they're really cool right like that's uh that's kind of a some things that happen in a hackathon right not so much security stuff um hacking illegally is all about consent if you know and if you consent um the knowing part is a little bit of a gray area to be honest so it's not exactly informed consent in some cases um i have worked jobs where the client said i don't want to know anything i don't want to know what you do i don't want to know how it gets done but i want you to go figure this thing out write down on some paper and tell me what I need to do now. Most of the time, that's like small businesses, um, tops. Uh, yeah, people like that. So what's the process when we talk about like hackers, right? First off, a hacker, uh, someone that is actually going to hack stuff and penetrate the security of it can be anyone. Okay, that's that's just a, a bare bones fact. Um, it can be literally anyone. Um, sometimes it's people that don't exactly know what they're doing, right? They're just like shoving in numbers or letters, sometimes uh, in a URL box on a browser. Um, other times they are actively like they know what they're doing, right? Uh, like maybe they're taking a raspberry pi and shoving it inside of a uh, a power strip that is hidden inside that's actually connected to the wi-fi and the power on that power strip and they're doing nefarious things right all things that i've seen irl so the process that a hacker normally takes um, and this gets more sophisticated as like in proportion to skill level and resources, right? Um, as you go up into like cyber warfare, um, like type 
echelons, then each piece of this process, this methodology becomes more sophisticated, right? So an example is like traditionally, what happens as a pen tester is you're going to go and try to collect recon of a certain uh, system. Sometimes it's a person, right? Sometimes it's a company. Sometimes it's um, a nation state, right? Whatever. Um, recon is split between active and passive. As soon as you start making traceable connections to the thing that you are reconning, it becomes an active recon. If it's passive, it means that there is no possible way to discern that you are collecting reconnaissance on the target, right? So that concerns whether it's a, uh, you actually meet and have a conversation with your target, who in that case would be a business, a person, um, a company, whatever. Or you are making um, some kind of network interactions with the target, right? Which that sometimes is uh, kind of interesting, right? If you are sending HTTP requests at a website owned by a company, technically you're making a connection and that's an active uh, reconnaissance at that point. However, if you are actually only interrogating the DNS server that you know has the domain name for that website, that's still passive. Because usually the DNS server you know, isn't necessarily going to be owned by the company. The main point is all about attack surface, right? You got to figure out what you don't know. And then you can decide, well, what am I going to do with this information now, right? So over on the right of this, you know, I've got like it applies to all targets, right? One of the interesting things is how hacking gets applied to open source intelligence investigations. Um, they're actually very similar and sometimes they overlap and they're often used together. So um, a lot of times what private investigators and law enforcement and those contracted by such will do is collect information on a particular individual they're investigating. This can be everything from like taxes, which tell you about assets, which tell you about what that person cares about, which tells you about, and so on and so forth, right? But similarly, with a business, it's the same thing. And those ki that kind of information is public, right? That is stuff that you can simply go search up and find. So the reason that's important is because learning those kinds of background information becomes useful later when you start looking at what's a vulnerability, right? When we're talking about Wi-Fi networks, we're looking at what's the encryption of that Wi-Fi network. Is it WEP? Is it WPA, WPA2, or three now, I guess? Um, which, those are like different, uh, depending on what the answer is, yes or no to those questions, tells you whether or not you can hack the Wi-Fi. If you can get into the Wi-Fi, that only gives you a foothold, okay? So that means you can now see what's inside of it. You can't really do much more than that. So the next step after that is once you know what the attack surface is, what options you have, now you look at what ways can you actually hack these things, right? So let's start talking about like Windows servers, which are pretty traditional targets. Um, or Linux ones, it doesn't really matter. So actually Equifax is a good example, right? Uh, a lot of you may have heard of when Equifax got hacked like, I don't know, five, 10 years ago or something. What happened was they were hardcore targeted. Somebody looked at all the possible information about that business. They looked at everything they could possibly figure out. They were able to get a foothold 
into the network. At that point, they conducted, you know, well, basically just looked at like, what options we got, what things can we hack? Um, and most of that was actually um, them escalating their privileges and hacking the way that Python works, right? So their exploitation was use Python and the way that it loads libraries in order to escalate their privileges and become root. At that point, they could go into this last step called post exploitation. At that point, that's where you decide, are we gonna set up back doors so we can keep getting back in? We're we gonna dump the database. We're we gonna try and clean up and remove any trace. Or are we just gonna totally destroy the environment? which sort of happened with Sony. Um, they were targeted by North Korea. Um, it's a pretty interesting story. A little bit out of scope, but go look it up if you're not familiar. It's pretty cool. So hackers and pen testers will use terms such as black box and white box to kind of describe what kind of situation are they dealing with. If it is a black box scenario, then they know almost nothing or usually nothing before they begin the engagement. They don't like they might know the company they're targeting. They might they may not know even like that. They might just be given like, here's a machine sitting on the internet, go target it. You know, here's a URL for a website, go target it. White box is very internal usually. Um, so white box is like usually by uh, red teams is the term for it, or offensive security teams. They have all the information available to them about you know what systems are actually in the environment. Sometimes they know how they're configured. Um, yeah, I mean they. They see, you know, from top to bottom, everything in the environment, but they're still trying to hack it anyways. So most of the time, there's not like a true, like, um, I'd say white box, because if you're internal in the company, even though you might be targeting like another team's application, you don't know a lot about that team. You only know what they documented what they made available, what you can find in, you know, I don't know, Confluence or documentation elsewhere, whatever, right? So that's a little bit of a spectrum. So let's talk about exploits, payloads, post exploits. These are actually technical terms, even though they sound a little bit generic, okay? Exploits it's any code that you can use in order to actually get the system to do something that it wasn't exactly designed to do. This is actually the source of why there is a um, overlap between hacker as a tech enthusiast and hacker as um, you know the person with the hoodie in a dark room happening in the matrix. Exploits are very interesting. Um, a lot of times, it's, and we'll see a little bit of this, we'll look at actual real exploits. Um, it is code that gets the system to execute or perform some kind of operation that like just it's not supposed to actually do, right? Uh, an easy example of this is uh, about 10 years ago, there was a router released by, um, I think it was Linksys, maybe? But they released a, a router called a Nighthawk, um, like 2500, bought that, I don't know. But it, was, it was a Nighthawk router. You can go to like any Walmart and find this router, right? And um, what this router did, right? It was geared towards gaming. But if you opened up your browser and you went to you know, 192.168.1.1, you know, your router's IP address, usually, then you could actually shove in, like, bash commands into the URL box. 
and execute that as root on that router, right? So what that means is that you could actually type in commands to start up a telnet session, which is an old way of remotely connecting to a router, and essentially gain complete command line access to that router simply because it sucked at uh, escaping characters and cleaning up the characters that you're putting into the URL box and sending to the router. So that was the exploit. The payload is what happens after you get the system to perform operations it's not supposed to. Payloads are pretty interesting uh, because that's like, when you start talking about code that's trying to evade uh, antivirus systems, you're talking about payloads. You're talking about uh, uh, things like shell code, right? Uh, which we're about to talk about. Um, post exploits sort of overlap, okay? Um, post exploits are like, what kind of stuff are you doing after you get remote access to a system in whatever form that is? When you hear the term malware, it is all three of these things shoved together as one big system, usually, right? So um, I think uh, later when we talk about, uh, uh, when we actually look at exploits, I'll show an exploit that was used by um, uh, the WannaCry ransomware, which is like, you know, one of the most major ransomwares that hit the world, you know, across the face of the planet. Um, probably the most prolific one, I think, uh, since. Um, they it actually used an exploit that was leaked from the NSA. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. So we talk about shells. These are like payloads, okay? Word shell is um, is actually I think it's slang, maybe, but a shell is just a terminal, right? And there's two kinds, and we have to talk about this so that there's a little bit of context in the exploits that we're going to be showing. Okay, so shells are our way in. We have reverse shells and we have bind shells. A bind shell is like the most intuitive and it's like the easiest to understand you've got two machines you know you're on one machine you send a connection to another and when that connection happens then it just opens up a port on that victim machine and gives you a terminal right so in this case right uh, there's kind of a precursor here to understand when computers talk to each other, they use ports to do so, TCP and UDP ports. These aren't like physical ports on the machine. They're like uh, virtual or digital ports, right? So um, in this case, over on the right, we see that uh, after the IP address, 192.168.1.2, you see 4444. Right, and what that is 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 using a command called netcat to initiate a connection to an IP address on port forty four forty four. Over on the right side, when it receives that connection, it opens up that port forty four forty four and gives back a terminal to anyone that connects on it. So anyone could connect in that port, and they're going to get a terminal into the machine. Reverse shell is a lot more common uh, because you're able to evade firewalls. If you have a firewall in place that blocks everything except port 80, which is not uncommon, right? then the way that you get around that is you have to get the victim to execute something. If they execute, a reverse shell payload, what happens is that the payload executes here on the victim machine. And when it executes, it will send the connection back 
to the attacker, right? And when that connection happens, it gets a terminal through that initiate connection back to the victim. The firewall doesn't know about it at all, right? It's not attacker to victim, rather it's the other way around, victim to attacker. So that's most common because um, when you start talking about like networking issues, like how you navigate, like do you guys imagine any company like out in Louisville, right? Well, they each have Wi-Fi's and they got machines sitting inside of them. Well, how do you get into that? The way you get in is you spam emails over every person in that company until somebody opens it. And when they do, they can open up a reverse shell payload. It makes the connection back to you. That's how you get around those sorts of things. So before we start actually diving into hacking stuff, are there any questions at this point? There might be some in the chat. Let's see. I was not monitoring it. Oh, no, just a recommendation on a BBC documentary from Julian. Thank you, Julian. Okay. Any questions for Charles? Feel free to come off mute at this point, guys. So you mentioned like uh, organization, they'll target organizations by sending like spam emails for people to like open an executable or an attachment or something like that can you can you use things uh like whether it's um like a an email service provider or something like that to scan for those kinds of things to to kind of intercept those as an organization you can, you can. um a lot of times when you do that sort of thing where like let's say that i'm trying to initiate like a, an email campaign against a company, right? And we'll just say construction company, right? Then um, probably the route that I would go, like my initial thoughts are they don't work with very sophisticated stuff. So they probably uh, are going to accept just like a Word document, right? That immediately opens up some avenues because Word documents, at least um, prior to uh, Word or Office 365, I guess, where everything's online, um, would allow uh, macros to go into a Word document, right? Like that used to be a thing. And what that allows you to do is to write code that when a Word document is opened, then it needs to run some set of code, right? Like this could be something akin to like PowerShell. So I would set up a, um, using like what's called a social engineers framework, set up a, an email campaign against the construction company. Um, I would immediately go do open source intelligence, figure out uh, every director or officer of that company, which is usually listed with the secretary of state, um, do like 10 minutes of doxing on each of them and right there I've got my targets, right? Uh, you could also use any division of government for this example as well. You send the email. It's got that attachment. They're probably going to get a warning about the attachment. But if it looks normal enough, they're going to ignore like um, content filtering, spam filters, anything like that. And they might open it. Same goes for PDFs as well. That's a thing. Uh, it is a similar uh, capability. Yeah, and I know as there's a lot. They of, open it, um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, as soon as they open it, I want code execution. If I get code execution, then things can happen. They can send the connection back to me. I can get in, um, or any other, you know, possibility really. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I think so. And then uh, there's probably also scenarios where you mentioned they they look up like high high 
profile people in the company and then they can kind of send emails as those people because there's that like authoritative aspect of like yeah. social engineering because then people are like oh it's the ceo like you know he something from him must be legitimate yep yeah, and that's um uh and even more so than that it is very easy to spoof a phone number to look exactly like someone else's um, I've done that on numerous occasions um, for pen tests, and it like it, there's almost nothing to it, right? Um, which there's a there's a whole two or three hours worth of info I could talk about when it comes to cell phones and hacking and uh, masquerading. I don't know the right word there, um, but yeah, it's uh, y you can do a whole lot with that. Uh, I see a couple other questions. Um, so there's a question, do we need to understand the port concept? Oh, okay, to understand what will follow. Um, not, not exactly. All you need to know is that when you reference an IP address, um, whether you know it or not, there is always a port number that's also going to be referenced. Use, sometimes that's invisible, right? For like websites, HTTP, it's usually invisible, but by default, it runs on port 80, right? I'm not gonna really spend too much time on ports. Um, I will tell you when I was like 18, 19, uh, first learning about hacking and networking, and I knew nothing. I would imagine that a computer is like a city and like a C port on that city like there were a bunch of C ports and each one dealt with a different kind of traffic, like HTTP, SSH, um, SMB, POP3. You know, that was the way I tried to analogize it in my head to try to make sense of it. And I, I didn't know anything about how networking worked at all. And then, uh, let's see. James asks, what about exploits using unsanitized text fields, user entry? That is still very common. That is quite common. Um, so the unsanitized text fields, user entry, um, this is how people are able to hack databases sometimes uh, through SQL injection or um, you, command injection in URLs. That's the thing. Um, Cross-site scripting for websites. Um, that's that's the thing. Uh, it. I mean, that's that's like the source of a huge portion of hacking. Um, there is there is like one kind of niche in um, like bug bounties uh, that only focuses on web app hacking, and a huge portion of those focus uh, strictly on unsanitized text fields, user entry. Um, one of the most interesting hacks that you can do is injecting commands into logs, right? Every time you send a request, an HTTP request, it gets logged on the web server, right? But depending on what kind of web server it is, you might be able to trick it into reading that log in order to execute code, right? That That is a thing. Um, I haven't done that in about seven years, but that's still a thing that uh, if you send HTTP junk, right, just some request, and you happen to include commands in that junk, it gets logged on the server, eventually read. Sometimes you have to trick the server into reading that log or series of logs, and then it will actually execute it. That's a, that's a pretty cool thing. Um, let's see. OK, cool. Yeah. And thanks, Chris, for offering more context. That's pretty cool. So let's kind of switch gears and go ahead and start hacking stuff. So I'm going to switch screens real quick.
Hey, yeah, this is uh, this is my favorite um, Google Meet theme. I call it Home Office. All right, and can you guys see this? So, yep. Oh, all right. I like your thumbs of support. Thank you. So um, this machine that I'm currently logged into is called Cali. Um, most of this will be on the command line. Here's why. Um, most hacks that like ever happen, right? Like are focused on command line. So um, let's just do that. Um, because when you get into a system, it's going to, um, it, you are probably only going to have command line access to it. And a lot of systems managed by sysadmins, DevOps people, like it's going to be, you know, managed through command line. So like, I, that's like the first thing that, you know, you've got to have a pretty solid understanding of is doing stuff on command line. Um, and like i'd say eight out of nine times or eight out of ten times it's going to be linux stuff right like that's a understanding windows command prompt and powershell is very useful most systems that you hack are probably not going to be windows machines um just because of the nature of the business however there are shops businesses that only deal in windows stuff and when they do that's the easiest hacks well i won't say usually but a lot of times there are like just glaring security vulnerabilities in those um, um those systems right so i'm currently logged in over ssh to um, a kali linux machine Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and send a link of what that is. Uh, wow, this gets set up. And Kali Linux is like the the standard tool that uh, that hackers use, uh, like anyone within the security space. That's like the operating system that typically gets used. Okay. This tool in particular is called uh, Metasploit. So the operating system is Kali Linux. The tool I'm using is Metasploit. Um, they have these really cool banners, I'm always a fan of. This has 2,440 exploits available in this framework, uh, 1,256 auxiliary modules, and so on and so forth, right? Um, first off, can everyone like see this okay? This will be kind of text heavy, I guess. You might want to zoom out just a little bit. Alrighty. That'll do it. Cool. So I'll spend it. So the first thing uh, that we care about is like, all right, well. I've got Cali, I'm in a network somewhere, and I, right now, I don't know where I'm at, right? So we need to know where we are in order to figure out where we're going. So if config is a nice tool that tells you about each of the interfaces you have and what your IP address is. I'm gonna take this IP address, IPv4, and we're going to basically scan the network to see what things can we find on this network. So there's this handy dandy tool called Nmap that it has all kinds of things you could possibly use and do with it, right? Nmap just stands for network map. Um, usually the way that we use it is pretty simple so you know don't don't feel too overwhelmed by this huge block of text uh, i ignore most of it uh, because it, 
I usually know exactly what I'm I'm trying to uh, to to do, right? So usually it's nmap, whatever the scan type is, the options, targets. So I care about let's go scan types. These are the different scan types, and SS is for TCP SYN, ST is for connect, SA for ACK, and so forth. Uh, we're just going to do this um, connect. Uh, TCP, TCP SYN used to be called a stealth scan, but they removed that because it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not actually a um, stealthy at all, actually. So what this does is, well, I, I kind of lied. Um, we will be doing the ST scan, but we don't really know what we're scanning first, right? So we're going to be using SN. I'm going to start moving pretty quickly after this point. This is a ping scan, OK? This is essentially an ICMP scan, which just means when you guys might type into the terminal, you know, like pinggoogle.com, right? What you're doing is the same thing as an SN scan, right? You're just seeing like, is it up? And I need to remember this IP address. Going to paste that in. Now, if I do that, that's only going to scan my current uh, address, right? So instead, I'm going to use a, um, a programmer move and do cider block range of um, you know zero slash twenty four. What that's going to give me is everything you know, like within this block. Uh, it's going to be one seven two dot three one dot two dot and it's going to be basically 1 to 255. That's like the most number of IPs you can have in this, this block. And I'm also going to do 1-2 uh, there. This is going to do the subnet like dot .1 and the subnet dot .2 range. You'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. So. Yeah, we got to figure out, like, all right, we know what our address is. Let's go look around and see what's around us, right? What things does our machine actually know about, right? So in a network, um, even if you're not connected to a network, every single device that you have constantly shouts to the world, okay? Your phone, your laptop, it shouts, broadcasts actually um you know hey does anybody have this ip does anybody have this ip you know that sort of thing and other machines or devices that hear that shout say hey yeah i know where that's at it's over here or hey i have that ip that's usually how that's how you find wi-fi networks on your phone that's how you you know look up like uh if anyone's ever used the shared drive in a company environment, that's how that works too, right? So it's lots of polite talking between devices. So this is kind of interesting, right? If we look at just one of these, it's just these two lines. It gives me this like IP, blah, 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 USC2 compute internal. And that's for this IP address. So that's kind of interesting, right? Because uh, I can kind of intuit, uh, if there's any DevOps folks here, you might notice that US is too, it, it looks a little interesting, right? So this is just using Nmap. We're not actually using Metasploit at this point, but we're about to. If I add DB underscore, what this does, is it's going to do the exact same scan, but it's going to load all of these hosts, these addresses, into a database. 
so that we can keep track of it, okay? So what this does now, right? Scanned 512 IPs in two subnets and it found 12 hosts, right? The second piece. So let's see what Metasploit actually gives us. What commands can we use? And there's a lot. I'm not going to go over all of them, but just to give you an idea. We got these core commands, right? Core commands are kind of cool. Like they just let you, you know, do some basic things, right? You can deal with sessions. You can, um, you know, do some multi-threaded stuff, spit out a cool banner, and basically do standard, like, terminal things. You also got some other options. Um, jobs are kind of cool because you can, you know, run multiple different types of jobs. Um, like maybe scan this thing while you're trying to brute force this other thing. And yeah, yeah. This database stuff is kind of what we're interested in at the minute. Just this DBN map, hosts, notes, services. So let's see what's in hosts. Okay, so this is kind of cool. We get these IP addresses. Uh, what's probably the operating system and where the name was, okay? So let's like actually find some things out about this. So I'm just gonna do a standard like TCP um, connect scan. This is going to connect to every port or at least the I think it's the most standard 1,000 ports on a machine. Oh, actually, we need to clean that up a little bit. That will take a while if I let that run. So instead, I want to only look at the address column for our hosts. And I'm going to copy all of this. I'm going to use the coolest program you've never heard about called VI. Uh, that's a joke in and of itself. And um, I'm going to, it's just a text editor that does a lot of stuff. I'm going to paste all these in, right? Just copy paste it. <laughs> yeah, Chris has got the right idea. All right, so. Um, so what that lets us do now, right, is instead of scanning 512 IP addresses, right, and do this magic thing called IL in reference to targets file that I just created, right? And we'll do that. So now it's only scanning 12, which was uh, pretty fast, actually. So I'm going to try and highlight because, like, you know, this looks like a wall of text, right? It ain't great. If you're not used to it, then, you know, it's, uh, it's like looking at the matrix. Uh, but like they say in the first matrix, you know, after a while, you know, I don't see all this text as you see, you know, a person walking down the road or a hot dog, you know, whatever. So this first one, uh, dot 62, and I'm going to kind of reference by 1.62 or like 2.39. Um, this first one, it's running something on HTTP, right? On port 8080, right? And the second one, this is kind of interesting, 1.109. It's running a Postgres database on 5432, which that's like the default Postgres, um, you know, system. Or... Uh, Default Postgres uh, port. You'll notice, though, that there are a couple that have only port 22 for SSH and 111 for RPC bind. I will tell you now, if you ever see RPC bind 111, you know, for the port, ignore it. Don't even try, right? Uh, RPC is, like, really weird when it comes to attacking. It's I've never been able to work with it. Usually, that's like a, it, it's just like a brick wall. 
right? It, it sucks. I'm not into it. Uh, this port 8888 uh, is kind of interesting because I have no idea what Sun Answer Book is. Uh, so, yeah. But is this all that we can really get out of this? So let's try. I'm going to, I've added this dash A, right? Which is going to do a bunch of other things. Okay. It's going to tell us, it's going to try to guess what the operating system is. It's going to tell us the versions of the software running on those ports. And that will inform us what things can we actually hack. Okay. So we're starting to see some stuff. Let's go way up. Right about here is where it starts getting uh, interesting. All right. So 1.62. The 8080 thing is running Kestrel. Can anyone tell me what Kestrel is usually used for? You guys might not know, but if you know, throw it in chat. Yep, Corey's got it. Hey, glad to see you, Corey. It is a web server. What things or systems usually use Kestrel for like the, the web server bit? Any guesses? And uh, software dev mentors are totally free to, to answer that, um, if you guys know. So there's also Postgres. Uh, this is basically using the latest uh, Postgres version. And what else? Uh, SSH 111. Yep, that's, that's like ignore it, right? All right, so Kestrel is used um, for .NET, right? Every time that you guys run like a web API, um, like project, and you you hit play in Visual Studio, right? It's going to pop up and it's going to say, um, like, okay, running, you know, give you the terminal. You're going to see some stuff happen, but like, how is it that when you open up the URL, um, you know, in your browser, it takes you to your um uh what you call it your web server right your web api or your blazer app right how does that actually happen well it uses kestrel so what that tells me is that that is a dotnet application of some sort probably dotnet 6 upwards that is running on that um so this is kind of interesting earlier we saw for port 8888 it told us done something, right? This says tornado. That's a little weird. All right. Now we're actually going to look for something we can hack. Uh, this is running MySQL database. Gives us a lot of information that uh, scares me. We're looking. Right now, I'm just kind of skimming. Um, that's a lie because I can't connect to that port. I got a little angry about that earlier. <laughs> um, if we type services in the Metasploit, now it's going to show us, like, okay, what things can we actually, you know, uh, target, right? Every time that you run a service that allows connections to it, like a web API project, right? or a Django app in Python. What's happening is it has to allocate a port, right? It's just an opening in your computer that, you know, digitally, that allows HTTP requests or any other connections to make it in, you know, into the system. So I'm gonna use the, uh, I, I think we go until seven. Is that correct, Allie? I'm trying to be conscious of time. Yeah, uh, we can, we just historically go a few minutes over but yeah if we can shoot for seven that's always great got it that's that's what i was thinking and planning um all right one second to me what looks interesting 
is this SMTP thing, right? SMTP is um, pretty interesting um, because it's traditionally been pretty vulnerable. Um, real quick, Chris, you mentioned Tornado, Python. You are correct. Uh, it is related, actually. And uh, when I see the Tornado thing, I think uh, Jupiter, right? So um, let's try to use that, right? So if I do use, and I'm going to double tab, um, there are 5,600 and 63 possibilities of things it could show me. What I care about, I want to use, I'm actually going to search SM, let's do open SMTP. And so SMTP shows me two different things, which are kind of interesting, right? The first is an exploit, the second is a local exploit. The way I tell that is, this has the word local in it. The other one does not. So that's kind of neat. So let's use. Um, and use that. I'm going to list out all the info about this exploit. So this is like you know the module uh, who wrote it. Uh, the license for it. Uh, this is hilarious that it was provided by Koalas. But that's a personal thing there. And we can, these are the options we need to set. We need something for our hosts, right? And I'm wondering, no, I'm not DBing that. Hosts. Hosts allows us to do a dash R right here, right? And we could use that. And what it does is it takes all of these IP addresses and lists them as our host, which is just like remote host, okay? So let's see what options we have. So when we send this, this exploit and we use it, it needs a valid mail recipient, our host, which that's taken care of, and the port number, right? And L host, which is just like the listening host, which I don't remember. So I'm going to copy that IP address and set globally the L host to be my IP address. This targets, you know, open SMTP for 6.4 to 6.6. .6. And right now, this is going to target everything in, you know, like our everything that Metasploit knows about, like the hosts, right? All of those IP addresses, though one of them just wins. So we get a lot of failures, right? Oh, that one will fail because 2.1 is, um, oh, something happened. This is kind of cool. Okay. Nice. So I think we can finagle with this a little bit. Um, let's just see. I think it's trying to work with um, Steve services. It's trying to work with that. Uh, the SMTP, right? That host. So I'm going to set L host to that, set the options, and I want to set the payload to something else besides this reverse net cap. That's like a standard payload. These are actually all the options that we have. These are all the ways that we could set a payload that you know gives us some type of access. And what I really care about is Meterpreter. So let's keep looking here. Okay, so. 
and I'm going to use Python, interpreter bind. All right, so everyone remembers the difference between bind and reverse, right? I hope so. So the bind, it's going to make a connection. It's going to open a port on the target, and we connect to it. See what that does. Yeah, oh, yeah. Takes a while in that. Uh... Oh, this is pretty nice, right? All right. So let's look at what we got here. All right. It's running an automatic chat. Text the service, connects to it, says hello, and sends the exploit. All right. Then, and it, this is like the aha moment as a hacker, is when you get a response back that says sending stage, right? Meterpreter session one opened, created in the background. That's pretty sick. So let's see what sessions we got. We got one session as root on the target, right? So I'm going to interact with session one. That's uh, pretty sick, right? So inside Meterpreter, we get all kinds of things, okay? We get tons of stuff that we can do just out of the box. We can actually crack the passwords on the machine. We can access the webcam. We can turn on the mic. We can take screenshots of their desktop, all kinds of cool things. I have done all of those things uh, within the legal boundaries of the law. Disclaimer. <laughs> um, <laughs> we can also just straight up like upload things onto uh, the machine if we want you know lots of stuff right so let's just see hey pretty cool who am i well it doesn't know about that i want to drop down into a shell Um, maybe, maybe it does it. Nah, I don't really want to do that. So, let's see. We can see all of the config stuff. And actually, let's just see what's at the beginning. Okay, this is kind of cool. This is immediately a Docker container. That's what the Docker env tells me. And the USC2 thing, right, uh, at the beginning, that tells me this is running in AWS. So that's kind of interesting there, right? Um, if we look in home, oh, every user in the machine has a home directory. This machine only has one user. Um, or at least one human user called Addy. But let's confirm that. And uh, at this point, we will be like wrapping up. So I want to look at the past WD um, file. I just like catted that out. What this tells me is what users are on the machine, uh, what their user ID and group IDs are, and what terminal they use when you know like something logs in right so um you'll see like no login that means it's probably like a system account right uh like bin daemon sync uh well not sync some of those they don't have logins right they run as users sort of but like system users or system accounts addy kind of cool right there she exists. So is the SMTP, SMTPQ users, which another quick way to tell, user accounts normally start at 1,000 and go from there. System accounts are usually below that. So, um, yeah. Let's root. Let's see what's in Addy. And then, nice. Yeah. So. At this point, we're root. We own the system, right? Um, if we have more time, there's like five of 
other machines uh, that we could hack. But we only do so much in an hour. So you guys will have to wait for next time uh, in that regard. But uh, I guess let me just go to any like last minute questions like before I turn it back to, to Ali. Any last minute questions, feel free to come off mute, y'all. Um, and we'll get wrapped up here. Thanks so much, Charles, for everything. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Yeah, it's been fun. There's like all kinds of things I'd love to show you guys. I'm upset there's yeah. only one terminal image. Oh, <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. Needed at least 20 more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, one thing I want to mention is I will be making the repository um, like public and send it in the uh, Slack for like how this whole thing is built. And um, it also includes like a walkthrough of like how all of that's done and also a list of resources if you guys want to look up like how do you learn how to do this stuff. Um, it's that sort of thing. So, yeah, that's all I got. Turn back over to Allie. Uh, yeah, so um, I guess, Martisha, uh, we will have the recording posted if you want to go back and, and review it. I know you're saying you didn't uh, retain much of it if it was a lot of information, so you're free to go back once that recording's been posted and review it for sure. Um, and then Keith says, uh, can these tools be used for on other Linux distros? Yes, um, it is. My recommendation is to use Kali Linux or um, there's a like one or two others. And the reason why is that most Linux distros have a lot of underlying stuff like that makes it difficult to use some of these tools. Um, almost all the things that you use in Kali or any hacking tool, you have to run it as root, right? which is like against best practice for every Linux admin out there. But that's like what you have to do. Um, yeah, that's, if you go use Kali, you just got it all there. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just now seeing a lot of these, uh, these messages. Uh, Marticia, is it more flexible? Um, to use Kali, yeah, because it's meant to just be, you spin it up, you use it, and a lot of times it's not even a persistent storage system. So it'll just, once you turn it off, the system will revert back to however it was. Um, yeah. 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 Great. Cool. Um, well, thank you, Charles. Um, is it okay if, I know Charles, you're pretty active on Slack, so is it okay if people message you with questions? For sure. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. Um, well, like I said, this recording will be available tomorrow um, once it gets processed and uploaded to YouTube, so you guys can always review it. And um, hopefully we'll see a lot of you next Monday on our next guest speaker series. Thanks, everyone.